की सदा या हुसैन सबका हो मर हबा या हुसैन मेरे दिल की the psychological and spiritual benefits of mourning for the tragedies that befell the household of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, cannot be understated. But what are the social benefits of holding mourning ceremonies in their remembrance? Why is there such a deep emphasis on coming together and creating space to recall the calamities that the Ahlul Bayt endured over 1400 years ago? First of all, mourning commemorations help to create a sense of unity and solidarity among the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. It allows their followers to come together and acquaint themselves with the traditions and biographies of the divinely appointed leaders. They provide a space for the revival of their legacy, help to establish people's relationship with them and enable them to benefit from their teachings. The remembrance of Ashura and the events that took place in Karbala on that tragic day is also a means to awakening the people to injustices occurring in this day and age. It allows people to empathize and side with the oppressed while standing against the oppressors of all times. It motivates people to create positive change in society, to ensure that justice is upheld and tyranny is eradicated. Mourning for an event associated with the Ahl al-Bayt is reviving their affairs. And this revival of the affairs revives the hearts. It revives the connection and the loyalty and the uh, association with these holy individuals. Of course, the Holy Quran comes forward and says, Anyone who indeed revives the signs of Allah is demonstrating God consciousness. And so the days that belong to Allah, Allah, according to the Holy Quran, include the days in which those specifically chosen individuals by the Almighty left this world and sacrificed their lives. So in their remembrance, it is of the utmost importance that the mourning takes place. Why? Because we see in many instances in the lives of human beings whereby a remembrance of an individual becomes a very dry, a very um, kind of robotic process whereby people just admire an individual and that's it. In the opinion of many of the scholars today, if there was no mourning sessions for Imam al Hussein and what he stood for and the principles and the values of the 10th of Muharram would no longer be with us today. It would have indeed been abolished and somehow exterminated many, many hundreds of years ago. But the very fact that there was emphasis is indeed highlighting the fact that it's increasing in number. The world's largest annual gathering, peaceful gathering, that is the walk to the city of martyrs, the city of liberation, the city of peace, uh, and the city of freedom, Karbala, that takes place every year during Arba'een, is very much based on mourning. And it's increasing year by year. And the generosity, the kindness, the servitude that people express are all down to the fact that over the years, there's been emphasis regarding mourning around the world today. In many different continents, in many different countries, you'll come to the conclusion that there are sessions of mourning. Sessions of mourning are positive. They're not only lamentations in the negative sense. They are some kind of a rebirth, a commitment when an individual strikes their chest with their hands. They're saying that I will want to follow in the footsteps of Hussein and I want to follow in the footsteps of the Ahad alayhi wasalam. It is not just a matter of he passed away 1400 years ago. So I'm just recording a historical fact. It is history plus what is alive today, what is important today, and what can happen in the future. Mourning has inspired so many revolutions and changes within and in societies, and therefore it is absolutely necessary. Throughout the course of history, mourning practices both in public and in private have often raised questions from other schools of thought, as well as the wider public. Is mourning for the Ahlul Bayt an obligatory practice according to the Shia school? And what of the issue of self-harm? Are some of these practices associated with self-harm? The misconceptions are two. <clears throat> One an ayat from the Holy Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, la tulqu bi aydikum ila tahluka. O you who believe, do not place yourselves into destruction. And the hadith from the Holy Prophet, la dharar wa la dharar of Islam. You cannot harm oneself and others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has requested 
us to do one thing in the Holy Quran if we want to pay back Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Prophet brought this beautiful religion of Islam, the final word of God. They asked him, Ya Rasulullah, how should we pay you back? The Prophet said, I ask for no wage, for no payment, for no compensation, except for the mawadda of my family. Mawadda is not only love, it's the expression of love. Express your love for my family, the Ahlul Bayt. This is a command in the Quran and it's wajib. It's an obligatory command. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to express that love for the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You, If you love someone, then you will be pleased in their pleasure and you will be grieved, aggrieved in their grief. There are those who come forward and say that some of the practices that we see around the world today under the kind of umbrella of Aza Dari or mourning or Aza al Hussein were not necessarily sanctioned by the Ahl al-Bayt or were not practiced by the Ahl al-Bayt. For example, some might say running towards the shrine of Imam al-Hussein that happens on the 10th, known as the running of Tuarij, for instance. Some might come forward and say beating the chest. We do not necessarily have a narration that one of the Ahl al-Bayt did this. Is this permissible or is it not? And some of the enemies of Islam and the enemies of the Ahl al-Bayt and the followers of Ahl al-Bayt have utilized these things to try and attack the whole institution of Aza and the whole institution of mourning. The answer to this is everything is halal unless there is evidence that it is haram. And we do not have any evidence that, for example, beating the chest is actually haram. In fact, we have narrations that for in Al-Bukhari Sahih that women in Medina used to strike themselves when they heard about the uh, sad demise of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as we said, the wife of Prophet Ibrahim Alayhi Salam would strike her cheeks when she heard that she is about to have a child. It's, a, it's an expression. It's something that is absolutely fine. Now, some might say, what about the whole concept of self-harm? Could these practices be considered self-harm? And the answer to this is very important because self-harm is not something that is a easy label to place on any practice. If I eat five pieces, large pieces of a whole entire cake, that is self-harm. If I don't do enough exercise, that is self-harm. Just by itself, self-harm is not necessarily considered to be a haram practice. What is forbidden is excessive self-harm that, that uh, causes damage to the body that is considered to be quite extensive damage. And so this becomes subjective now. This becomes something that people differ in. And that is why within the school of Ahl al-Bayt, we have the beautiful system of ijtihad and marja'iyya. We have maraja, we have great scholars who have invested all their lives into producing these uh, edicts and fatwas to issue whether a, such a practice is permissible or such a practice is not. And therefore, people would follow their own marja in certain cases, whether they are doubtful about a certain particular practice that may not be entirely practiced by the Shia of whether it is permissible or not. But self-harm has to be placed on a degree and is not just something that can be somehow uh, painted with the same brush towards every practice of Azhar and mourning. Critics have often alluded to the fact that mourning over a battle that took place over 1400 years ago holds little relevance in the modern day. They claim that the tragedy of Karbala is an event that occurred far back in history and that delving into it to such an extent holds little value today. To what extent is the remembrance of Karbala still relevant in this day and age? What role does mourning continue to play in our lives today? How can mourning for Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, be a tool for reviving the spirit of Islam and its principles, especially when it comes to fighting against injustice and standing for the oppressed? Mourning will always remain uh, relevant because of a number of reasons. Number one, it reminds you of the pain Imam Hussein Islam went through, just like Eid al-Adha is a reminder of the pains that Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, Nabi Ismail alayhi salam, and Hajra salam alayhi have went through. So Ashura is a reminder of the pains that he went through. Number two, it reminds you of the stance against 
uh, evil and against oppression? Sometimes we have to also uh, be aware of what the perception of the Western world of certain practices, whilst it may be okay to perform them in our own places of worship, uh, Husseiniyas and Masajid, it may not be on the streets. Because as much as you try to explain that this is out of love and demonstration of loyalty, it may not still sit well in the minds of some of the Westerners. And the message of Imam al-Hussein might get lost then because we might not be able to impact them the way we can and should. When the Holy Quran talks about the method of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, He sent every prophet with the language, the tongue of His people. You have to communicate to people in a way they can understand that is in accordance with their mentality. I know there are some elders in, in, in our communities, in, in various communities, they want to mourn Imam Hussein the way they did back home. And they don't give the youngsters, the youth, a chance to mourn Imam Hussein السلام, in a different way. It's okay, let's keep our traditions. Value and cherish your traditions. Let your children see how you did it back home, that's fine. But we also have to give room to our youngsters. If they live in a society, and in that society there are more effective means to mourn, we should give them that freedom, we should give them that flexibility. Otherwise, we will lose these generations. Uh, I think we need to utilize the new languages. Uh, so not only just Arabic and Farsi and Urdu and some of the other languages that we use. Uh, we need to use the languages of the countries that we're in, uh, in our speeches, in our um, latmias, in you know, the nohas and the recitation, the poetry. We need to use the local languages. We also need to give message to the locals. So the, these were means of introducing the Ahlul Bayt to the people and they should continue to be the means. And we can only do that if we use the language of the people to do tabligh to them, to, to, to preach to them. Also, we need to understand what do these different methodologies that we use for, for grief. You know, we need to explore other methods that people would understand that they are grieving, they are crying, they are mourning. Uh, and we need to convey that very clearly. They should understand that we are saddened and we should also continuously say who we are mourning for. They, people should understand that this is not for someone, can, you know, now. Someone 14 centuries back means so much to us that we still grieve for them. That needs to be conveyed. When you look at the story of Imam Hussein salam, it's one that resonates with, the, with everyone, the young and the old the poor and the rich, children, they're moved by it. Educated people, uneducated people, people of all races, of all backgrounds, even non-Muslims, when they hear the story of Imam Hussein, which is filled with grief and sadness and sorrow, they are motivated to learn about Imam Hussein. They are moved. That emotional dimension of the legacy of Imam Hussein, which causes us to mourn, is an invitation to everyone to join the ship of Imam Hussein for he is the torch of guidance and the ship of salvation.